man. At Hockey Ministries, we are uh, truly an international mission. And, uh, yep, next slide. We, uh, we're honored to, to be able to serve with uh, 350 plus teams um, running across 43 leagues internationally um, with a, a bunch of NCAA conferences and online virtual chapels that have begun um, as of late as well. And uh, the big picture of hockey ministries is, is and yet yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a just scraping the surface of really um, the hockey world that's out there. And, and there are so many other teams to connect with and um, we continue to reach out into, into uh, the next level. And so um, just really appreciate but uh, there was this moment in time um, that happened uh, on, on April the, uh, the 6th when all eyes were drawn uh, to, to a small um, prairie intersection. And uh, around the hockey globe, people paused and reflected and took stock. Um, and for a moment, we were drawn in. And, and uh, the chance to mourn and to reflect and uh, to be a part of, of praying for a community um, and, and a town and, and parents and, and players and families. And uh, Pastor Sean, when, when he uh, was, was preaching at the, the vigil um, just a couple days after the accident, um, he landmarked for us something significant, I think. And, and he, he, he touched on the point that uh, we're, we're in the shadow of the valley of death. And, and the pain and the ache of that and the reality um, struck a chord, even for us across watching on TV. And uh, I have to confess that, um, you know, working with Hockey Ministries now for 15 years, I'd never heard of Humboldt. And I'd never heard of Nippon, And I'd never heard of Tisdale. And it's amazing how a moment in time God widens our map, and he shows us how small the world is, and how fragile and fleeting life is. And so we, we all kind of connected in um, to this, and uh, it's my privilege and honor um, to introduce a teammate, uh, a guy that I didn't even know um, beyond and before this, this event. And uh, I want to introduce Sean, a father of four. Um, a chaplain, a pastor, and, and a husband. And uh, Sean, it is just a great thrill to have you here with us this morning. Uh, please share with us a little bit of your hope uh, beyond the shadow. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, buddy. Well, it is really, a, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful that when you talked about great hockey players seeing the ice, you picked two Oilers. Did you, know, you noticed that probably, right? Uh, no, that was, that was good. My very first NHL game was Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier and Yari Curry, and I said, oh, man. I've been in love with the Oilers ever since and disappointed every year, so it's been great. <laughs> um, about three years ago, uh, three years, I've been pastoring a church in Humboldt for eight years now, and about three years ago, um, our church was... Uh, you know, just coming off a church plant status and moving into autonomy and, and so on. And so we had a lot of people coming and going and, and so on. And then three years ago, I got a phone call from my mom and said, Hey, your new hockey coach, um, I, I know his mom. I'm like, oh, okay, that's weird. And, uh, and so his, his name's Darcy, you should look him up. And so, yeah, no, I was planning on doing that as the chaplain anyway, so I'll do that. And so I went to meet with Darcy, and it was sort of an instant connection. Dar Darcy came as a head coach, general manager, and, uh, and we just, not, not just because I was the chaplain, but we just sort of naturally as, as human beings um, shared a lot in common. Um, Darcy would often joke that, you know, Sean, we have a lot, of, lot in common. We both work with people, and people are stupid. And, <laughs> and so it was his description of what he did and what I did. I'm not sure if... You know, if pastoring and coaching are maybe somewhat similar. And he said, the other thing is, is we both have wives that make us look really good. And I said, yeah, that's very true, you know. And, and more than that, Darcy just, uh, he had this strange and twisted sense of humor that he loved 
to create awkward situations where everyone felt uncomfortable and then just leave them. So everybody else felt uncomfortable after that. And uh, it was just, it was hilarious to watch and be a part of and terrible when you were the butt end of the joke. And uh, what, just give you an instance or a couple instances of how this, this showed up. Darcy, once at a hotel, spent about 10 minutes just standing at one of those metal napkin dispensers. You know what I'm talking about? And it just stood there staring at it until finally someone came up and said, what's wrong? And he just said, the stupid toaster's broken. <laughs> you know? And then the lady would go on to explain, well, this is not a toaster, you special human being. And, uh, and he would just walk away like nothing had happened and, and leave her seeming like the silly one there. Um, so I got to know this, this kind of weird sense of humor that he would just sit there with this little dumb smirk on his face. And, uh, and I got to recognize that little smirk and then not comment because I knew that smirk meant I'm going to look like the idiot, not you. And so about three weeks after he had moved there, he said, Sean, why don't we go? I got to scout some players in, in Moose Jaw a couple hours away. He said, why don't you hop in the truck? We'll go, we'll go together. I said, sure. So hopped in the truck, and we talked for a little bit. And he says, hey, I've been, uh, been listening to audiobooks when I travel. It's been really good for me. And I got this audiobook I think you'll really appreciate. And so he put it in, and, you know, up pops on the display of the, of the truck. It pops up. I'm like, I recognize the author of this. And the, the book was entitled Get to the Point. And it was a book on how to preach better and you know, cut down the length of your sermon and all these different things. So he, he turned it on and I'm not going to satisfy this guy's twisted sense of humor. I'm going to let this play out and see how long he'll sit there. Well, he sat there. We listened to the whole book on the way there, an hour and three quarters there, and then almost two hours back, and then the book ended. And uh, I said, yeah, that was a really good book, Darcy. Thanks. I downloaded a podcast while we were watching the hockey game. It's how to coach better. And he just, <laughs> he didn't find that very funny, but, <laughs> but I did. And so we, we just, it was a back and forth thing. We really had a, uh, you know, a good bond just as, it's just two men. Our families were close. Our kids played together. Um, they came to our church. His parents came to our church. And we just, uh, Darcy had a unique ability. If you've ever seen Darcy's core covenant, um, if you haven't, look it up. The very first line in his core covenant is this, family first. This is what he wanted his hockey players to, to, to understand. The very first thing to be in a part of a, being a humble Bronco was priority one was family first. Now, Darcy lived that just in his own family, but it was also something he fostered just naturally. Something that was very important to Darcy was to expand. He, he called it expanding his family. And he wanted to bring other people in. And, and we were recipients of that, my, me and my family. And it was at a, a critical time that I had Darcy as a friend, I think. And, and if you've been in ministry or know anyone in ministry, sometimes it's a, it's a very lonely place to be. And Darcy was the kind of guy that, that uh, um, included you or expanded his family to include you. And he did that with his players. He did that with the community. He did that with everybody. It just, they became part of his family. And so... On April 6th, as we went to the hockey game uh, in Nippon, we were traveling as a family to go and to cheer. And uh, the game before, Darcy had ripped his pants trying to throw a water bottle at the ref, and we were, weren't sure what Darcy was going to do this time. And, and uh, so it, we, were, we were excited to go to the game. Um, but approaching Nippon, I got a phone call from his wife. He said, what have you heard? There's, there's been an accident. And then another phone call, the fan bus, and all these other things that that were coming out as we approached the accident. And for 10, 15 minutes as we traveled, it was phone call after phone call and text message and wanting to know what was up. And, and, uh, and so as we came to the accident, um, talked to a firefighter, and the firefighter, um, after finding out who I was, took me up to the accident, and, and I wandered around, and I, I realized very quickly that this was not the fan bus. There's hockey bags all over the, the ditch, and, and I could see the team jackets and and different things that, that I knew exactly who it was. And my first thought was, where is Darcy? And uh, I wandered around for a little while and uh, finally talked to a firefighter and just said, you know, what, what can I do? I, I want to help. Uh, is there anything I can do to help? And he just says, no, r really, you just need to let us do what we need to do. And so I, I said, I'd like, I'd really like to meet the guys at the hospital in Nippon as they're coming there. And I sent another chaplain to Tisdale and I asked that they would meet... Uh, meet uh, the guys as they came to Tisdale and then coordinate with me who was where and, and so on. And, and so 
we jumped back in the car with my family. We drove past the accident and then toward on to Nipawin. And as we got to Nipawin, my we got a phone call and we arranged. We we figured out that there was a church where they were going to rally all the parents um, who were coming to Nipawin for the game. And so I I asked my wife if she would go there with the with the kids and meet families and and stuff there. And I'd go to the hospital and we'd um, we try to coordinate with each other. So got to the hospital. The hospital was just absolute bedlam, um, and yet controlled. Like the healthcare uh, for a small town in Saskatchewan, I, I have never seen something so well oiled and yet so chaotic at the same time. Uh, they handled themselves so well, but the hard part of the whole thing was to figure out who was who. Uh, many of the jackets have been cut off or, or taken off, which, had, which would have had their number on them. And every one of them had blonde hair. Every one of the guys in that league is almost the same size. Um, everyone looked the same, and so often with trauma, there's, it was just hard to know who was who. And so most of the, that night, probably for three hours, was just trying to come up with who was who and who was even on the bus. And so with all this confusion and with all this uncertainty, every 15 minutes I'd get a phone call from either Darcy's mom or Darcy's wife. What do you know? What do you know? I spent the whole night walking around that hospital, trying to figure out who was who, by the process of elimination, realizing that there's not many guys here. Phoning Tisdale, who's there? And trying to figure out, is Darcy at one of the hospitals? He's got to be at one of the hospitals. And I came to terms pretty quickly with the fact that if they're not at a hospital, they're likely gone. And so having, having to go through that right in the moment probably came to terms with who was gone and who was not rather quickly. And at 10.30, Christina phoned again. And, Where is Darcy? And I just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And so Darcy was gone. I, I had to tell her. And uh, that, that started a, a long night on Friday night. Um, April 6th was a, was a really tough night. Just not sleeping, wrestling with what, what just happened, you know. And... Uh, what is this going to look like now? And uh, I just laying there in bed and having all sorts of people send me messages and all, you know, we're praying for you, we're looking out for you and doing whatever. One of my, one of my good friends, a, a fellow pastor, uh, just sent me this, this one little reminder. He said, just remember, Sean, God is still on the throne and he walks close to the brokenhearted. And it's, it's something that has resonated with me. It's stuck with me. Um, and it, it was so timely that, that it came at just that time, and it, and it was something that began to be something that repeated in my mind, and then as we traveled the next day, my wife was actually the one to bring up uh, Psalm 23. She just said, this feels just like that shadow that was mentioned here. It feels like we're walking it. And so I, as my wife was driving into Saskatoon to go to the hospital, with, and I was just riding and, and just praying and reading and we're talking, and and I st so I read Psalm 23. And as I read, you know, that even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and that's where we were stuck for a long time, you know, just that's all we were thinking. That's all we could see. And then as um, my wife wisely said, just keep reading. And she says, but I will fear no evil because you're with me. What a, what a profound truth that there was in this someone who has not changed, someone who remained faithful, and yet, in, from my perspective as a sheep, a dumb sheep, all I could see was the valley. All I could see, see was the, the darkness and the fear and the worry and the, the unknown, and that's all I could see, um, but it was good to be reminded of a good shepherd, and that was a very refreshing thing. And then to go to the hospital again and to go walk back into that, that chaos and the confusion and, the, and just all the bedlam that was, that was a part of part of that. Then I found out Saturday night that they, they couldn't find anyone to speak on, on Sunday night. And so Saturday night, I, I just, <laughs> I sort of, I'm like, what am I supposed to say? I don't have anything for anybody. And, uh, and so I, I just, wrestling with my own thoughts and with my, the own, my own things that, that the Lord had been revealing to me, um, I puked it out on my own town. <laughs> you know, that this is, this is what the Lord has been showing me. And, and I knew if I needed to hear it, so did other people too. We serve a God who's in control. It may not seem like it sometimes. 
Um, but in the midst of very unknown and a uh, world that goes all over the place and gets turned on its head sometimes, it's good to know that we have a God who doesn't change. And in the, in the process of the, the weeks and, uh, and months now after, God has shown me a couple other passages of Scripture that have been uh, of huge importance to me. And I'd like to share a couple of them um, with you. Um, and one more that just came uh, actually yesterday, er, on Thursday. Um, I was just sitting in the morning, getting ready for the morning, and uh, I was reading, and uh, once again, God seemed to just remind me of something that I needed to be reminded of, that I'd read it before, that didn't make sense, and then at, at that moment on Thursday morning, it just, it hit me how, how crucial that is. So I'd like to share those. So the first one is actually something a couple months ago that I came across, and, and it is in the book of Luke. Now, Luke was not a disciple of Jesus, um, but he endeavored to write something on behalf of somebody else, to write one of the gospel accounts of Jesus. And so Luke hadn't walked around with Jesus. He hadn't been a part of the stories. And so it's really interesting. When he starts his letter, he says this. Um, Many people have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the very beginning, I have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. That last verse just almost jumped off the the page and whacked me in the face. This is what I needed. And, And I was convinced, but I was becoming more convinced of the things that I already knew. And the reason that Luke wrote, he says, I want to carefully investigate it. I want to talk to other people that have experienced it and walked as an eyewitness. And then I want to write an orderly account so that I can tell other people that they can be confident about what they believe. Don't you like that? That's what I want. I want to be so confident in the the God that I serve and worship and that I talk about that I'm left with the word there, the certainty of what I believe. I want you to be certain. And, and so as I've endeavored to, to tell the Broncos story, but also to present a God who does not change, a God who remains sovereign, and a God who remains walking close to the brokenhearted, I wanted to, to do that with certainty. Now that didn't just come. I don't have a, some idiotic blind faith that I just, you know, boy, I hope this is right. I, I spent a long time in my life not just not just believing something blindly. I've investigated it. I've looked at Scripture. I've looked at the promises that were there for centuries, and then almost a thousand years later, some of them, they came true. And so it has been over constant investigation. I have walked with people before this accident happened and seen the Lord change their life. God has given me evidence and certainty and consistency, and so I've been been telling people that trust is an interesting thing, isn't it? Trust, trust is established through time plus consistency. That's how we establish trust, in a relationship with each other. Now, trust can be broken like that, right? But it's established over time and consistency. And for my relationship with Jesus, it, it's been both of those. So do I expect people in the midst of this tragedy just to jump on board and say, yeah, that's, yeah I like that? No. It, it is this, this whole idea that investigate. Can, can you trust? I, I had a Bible school professor that asked this question, and it stuck with me ever since. It says, can you trust a God who keeps secrets from you? What if he doesn't tell you why he does what he does? Can you trust him? And he, he asked us to, to think about that, and that's immediately what came to mind in the midst of this tragedy. Has God revealed enough of himself to enable us to trust him, that he is a consistent God, the things that he has revealed about himself, if we investigated it properly, can we trust him enough with the information that we have to be okay with the information we don't? And I I will tell you that Luke chapter 1 has become a heart cry for me. I I, I know now with certainty that this God that I trust, I can still trust, even though he might keep the secret of why this happened. It's, It's okay. Because he's revealed enough to me um, things that I know for sure. So the second part of this 
is interesting. So Luke wrote two books. He's this Dr. Luke that traveled around with Paul. And imagine how he got his information. He says, I've carefully investigated this by examining and talking to eyewitnesses. So he went and talked to the, the leper, maybe, that guy that Jesus healed. Or he maybe went and talked to some of the other disciples or talked to Jesus' mom or talked to all these different people to get the account of what their perspective was about who Jesus was. And as he gathered information, he says, I'm going to write this down for some lawyer named Theophilus or maybe a lawyer or some higher-up official. He says, I'm going to write this to you so that you can be really confident about what you believe. I'm going to collect this information for you from other people, and I want to tell you that God's still working. Let me show you how this happens in part two of Luke's account. So he endeavored to write this orderly account. The second part of Luke's writing is in the book of Acts. And so he starts the book of Acts, and he says this, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Which leaves us to understand and to think that what Jesus started to do in this first orderly account about when Jesus walked on earth, the second part of that is that Jesus is still working today. And so we're left in the book of Acts. After Jesus went up into heaven, Jesus is still working. He's still doing stuff. And so he wanted us to be so confident about who Jesus was, what he came to do, what his character was, how he loved the way that he treated people, touching the leper, looking after little kids, elevating the role of women. This is who Jesus was. This is what Jesus continues to do and to teach us today. And that's revealed in the book of Acts. And I, I am so thankful that hockey ministries, uh, there are pastors, there are missionaries, there are just everyday people like Darcy coaching hockey teams that Jesus is using to show other people what he's like. And not just to show, but to tell. And, and this, is a, this is a powerful thing that Jesus continues to do and to teach through other people. And he reveals himself through the church. He reveals himself through the love of other people, the care, uh, the miraculous that he, he can, only he can do in changing the heart of a person, in giving hope in hopeless cir circumstances. That is the work that Jesus continues to do. And this is what I'm so thankful for. The last passage I want to take you to is in the book of Isaiah. And this is where, um, in my time, just on Thursday morning, I, I came to. And I read this passage, and I, and I really would like you to leave you with this. So what is, why is it that I trust this God? And, uh, and so <laughs> I think it fits so well. And I'm so thankful that we had a worship band here. I'll just tell you that the most meaningful time for me after this accident was Darcy's funeral. Um, at Darcy's funeral, his, his wife, Christina, picked eight worship songs to be part of the funeral. And I remember as a pastor, I went to her and said, Christina, that is way too much singing. Way too much singing. And she says, no, you can quit preaching. We'll keep singing. Um, and I said, okay, done. And I remember standing on that stage, weeping my eyes out, singing songs that I've sung a hundred times, but being reminded of who God was through those worship songs. And it was the most incredible thing for me to, to just stop and remember who God was in the midst of this all over again. And it was so refreshing for me to worship God. And, you know, there's an interesting part of Psalm 23. It says, you know, he, he leads me beside still waters and all these other things. And then it says this, that he restores my soul. I love that. That's a divine work that God does. The good shepherd, the one who knows his sheep, he, he knows just how to restore our soul. And for me, I needed to be reminded again, but then to express it by singing, just, I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies, angel armies is always by my side. Sung that a thousand times. And yet, at that moment, I realized I'm not alone. You know, it, and it just came by being reminded through song and through worship. So in, in Isaiah chapter 49, it says this, shout, shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on the afflicted. But Jerusalem said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten us. Does that sound familiar? Don't you even care? I can't believe you would let this happen. How could you let this happen? Where were you? Why did this happen? It's the same cry that, that Israel had here. Jerusalem had it. And then God responds with this 
really weird but incredible statement. Can a mother forget the baby that's at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she bore? Though she might forget, I'll never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your wails or your cries are ever before me. <laughs> Can a mom forget her baby? I, I would tell you that any one of those moms that lost their son in that accident aren't, aren't going to forget and never should forget their son. But think about it for a second. What did that baby ever do for his mom? He cropped his pants. He cried all night and kept her awake. Made her grouchy the next day. Um, now she, she pees a little bit when she coughs. You know, what did that baby ever do for mom? Nothing. But did that change that she loves that baby? Oh, man. She would, <laughs> my mama bear would, would kill for her babies. You know, and, and yet, so when God turns around and says, you know, would, would a mom forget her baby? Even while she's nursing that baby? No, come on. And God's reminding his people, says, I haven't forgotten you. I haven't abandoned you. I'm still holding you. I'm looking after you. I'm nursing you. That mother might forget, but I'll never forget you. And so she, he, he says this, see, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. What a picture. It doesn't say I've tattooed you. It doesn't say, hey, I wrote your name on the back of my hand. It says I engraved you. Now, Jesus goes to the cross. They stretch him out. They put nails in his hands and his feet. He dies on that cross. They bury him. He rises again, and his disciples are waiting like, what just happened? Have we been completely following the wrong thing? Jesus is gone. What do we do? They're scrambling. They're, they're worried. They're frustrated. They feel abandoned. They feel lost. And then Jesus appears to them. And what does he show them? His hands and his feet. And the, the scar on his side. He says, see, the nails and the, the prints in my hand, this was for you. And so he reminds them at that point that the scars and the engraving of, on his hands was done for us. So do we have a God that cares about us? Yeah. Do we find the character of God and the love of God and the person of Jesus? Yeah. I have never been more certain in my life that my God has not abandoned me or forgotten me. God has not abandoned Humboldt. He has not abandoned our nation. He has not given up on this world. He continues to love people just like his little babies. He hasn't forgotten. And he has engraved us in the palms of our hand if we would receive him by faith. And he's, our God is a God of hope. Amen? Yeah, I got Mennonites in my church. They give better amens than you guys do. <laughs> That's poor. I want to pray for you if we can. Father, I thank you for this privilege of just opening the word together. I thank you that we can confidently know you. And we will find you if we seek you with our whole heart. We thank you for that. And so I thank you for the chance to have carefully investigated and watched and walked with people and seen how you have transformed lives and given hope in hopeless situations and, and encouragement and brought light into very dark times. And I thank you for being a shepherd who walks close to the sheep and a father who loves his children even better than an earthly father could. I thank you that uh, you have given yourself for us, that you have engraved us on the palm of your hand, that you love us. Help us to remember that, but also help us to respond to that in appropriate ways. We pray for this town, our, our great country, as vast and diverse as it is, and, and yet how small this hockey world has become and how deeply impacted it has, it has impacted Humboldt and our nation and our world, um, just the fragility of life. And yet in the midst of all this turmoil and all this unknown, we know that we can trust you with certainty. We thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Sean, thank you so much. That is uh, profound. And you would, you, you, Sean asked me before, will we have question and answer? And I said, uh, no, we wouldn't. But I would actually like to just ask you a question. And that is just if you wouldn't mind speaking to the, the situation of some of the players uh, who are still are sort of in recovery mode and, and where they're at. Yeah, there's... Uh uh, re recovery mode is an interesting one. I guess the, the, almost all of them still do physiotherapy and see counselors and different things like that. 
Um, but there's one, one young man, his name's Morgan, who is still in the hospital, um, just uh, having to retrain everything, you know, how to speak, how to walk, how to do all those things. And, and so the brain injury that way. Other guys, Lane Matichuk was another one that was in the hospital, just went home about a month ago, not even a month ago. And so they're, they're at different stages. Other guys, incredibly, you know, guys that were paralyzed are now playing sledge hockey and just trying to move on in life and uh, trying to move and, and carry on, so. You met with two players uh, yesterday who were with you with, with the Broncos and now are playing, and I always get the initials mixed up, but it's the university that's in Oshawa, the Technical University in Oshawa. How are they? I, I think good. I think, you know, in a sense, coming to obscurity a little bit, not always being recognized, and one of them is from a small, um, a smaller town in northern Saskatchewan, so it's recognized everywhere it goes, and, and, and just got sick of answering the same questions over and over again, and it became almost burdensome. So he was, we sort of saw that he was starting to pull, the, pull away, and, and so it was, I think it's been really good for him to be out here, both of them, I think, um, because it, it allows them to process things in their own time, not being reminded of things constantly, or, um, you know, in some weird way of being coddled, you know, <laughs> how are you doing, and people, well-meaning people that don't really care about the answer. And, uh, and so it's, I think they're, they're on the mend, um, but the challenges will be is, is wrestling through that now alone. So there's, there's good things in being this far away from home, but there's dangers, I guess, in it too. And so they have each other. Thankfully, there's two together. So. And just, a, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I have heard you state that those that may have, have suffered the least physically may face the greatest challenges just comment on on that yeah so there's two guys that walked basically walked away from the accident and so remember vividly the images of that you know and, and then many of the people who had pretty severe trauma don't remember anything from that night or even a week after and there's there's a great grace to that <laughs> in in not remembering a lot um and yet having to wrestle through grief and the loss of their teammates and things. And so it's, yeah, I, I think the ones that do the best physically are probably remember the most, right? That's, and that's what I mean by that statement. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, stay here. We have some precious uh, chaplains here uh, that serve with uh, us in Ontario. And I just wonder if you wouldn't mind coming and, and just join us, join us here at the, uh, at the front here. I know, uh, Jeff, join us, and Ra I saw Robin here, and Phil from the Owen Sound Attack, Robin from uh, um, the Hamilton Bulldogs, Dave Reed here from Aurora Tigers, uh, Justin from the Guelph Storm, Mo Gillard here uh, from Niagara Ice Dog, Jared uh, from uh, St. Catharines, and Jack, welcome, from uh, Oshawa Generals. I just wonder if we could um, have a moment where, uh, where uh, Jeremy, come in. Yeah, Jeremy oversees uh, Western Ontario uh, for us. And we could just have a, a word of prayer together. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that uh, we can come into your presence. And we, as we come, we know that indeed that in this story, something has gone terribly wrong. That uh, there's brokenness. There are parents that are facing their first Christmas without their son. There are parents that are wondering what will the future look like for their child. And there are just young men that are exploring, you know, what the future will look like for them. And we thank you that even as we think of this brokenness and this pain and this loss, that we can know that indeed you are the good shepherd. And I don't like it, and I don't understand it, and we can be confused about it. But we do know that somehow in the midst of it all, you do lead us into green pastures and still waters because we do need that. We need your nourishment. We need your presence. We need your restoration. And that profound thought of restoring our souls in the frenetic world that we live in, the busyness, the noise, and the confusion, um, we just thank you that you are present. Mm. 
And Father, we thank you that uh, in the case of a person like Darcy, that he has gone through the shadow and he has the valley of the shadow of death and he has not feared mm. evil because you are with him and he is with you. Mm. And we thank you that that's true because of Jesus. Mm. And Father, we know that our brother here, Sean, has seen things and heard things and been part of something that is horrible and there are memories there and we would pray that you would continue to restore his soul and uh, we thank you for his heart for you for his faithful presence as a pastor and faithfulness in the arena mm. and we would pray that you would bless him as a dad and as a husband and you would just continue to keep him close into your heart and I thank you for these guys that are standing here with us here that just quietly go about being your presence in this peculiar world of hockey. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thank you for their faithfulness and we would just pray you would continue to sustain and provide for them. Thank you for each person that's gathered here that allows you know, your spirit to work through them and to be your presence as they go from here. We thank you that we can pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. We do want to thank you uh, for coming and, and uh, being part of this morning. Um, one thing I, I love to, uh, to share is, um, you know, if you think about Ontario and... Um, you know, males that are 17 to 20 years old, you know, what percentage of them would be involved in some sort of regular Christian activity? Um, and, uh, you know, it, you know I, I talk to people that know more than I do. Some people say it's 8%, some people say it's 12% or something like that. But represented up here were a number of OHL and OHA chaplains. And if you're playing, you're a male playing on one of the 20 teams, in the OHL, 40% of OHL players are involved in our chapel. I mean, if you know anything about the culture of hockey, that's astounding. And I would love to say that's because of good planning and hard work. But if you know anything about Paul Allen, you know it's the grace of God. And it is nothing more than the grace of God. And, you're, you're, and, and therefore, you know, as, you, as we hear this story, we, we know the, how we have nothing other than the Good Shepherd. And we go into a world of suspicion and hostility and doors open because of the Shepherd goes before and opens those doors. And therefore, thank you for your, your support of this. Thank you for your prayers uh, in this. And uh, we just pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you as you, as you go from here. God bless.